Coming up next, the Flintstones meet the Jetsons. Uh-oh, I smell another cheap cartoon crossover. Bart Simpson, meet Jay Sherman the Critic. Crossovers are something that have been around for a long while now, but in recent years it feels like they're completely oversaturated in the market to the point that a crossover announcement doesn't feel like as big of a deal as it should be. It feels less like, how is this possible? And more like, when is this happening? Like we're expecting it to happen eventually. This might make me seem like a pessimistic old geezer, but I really do miss when the crossover events felt like actual big events. I remember whenever there was a big TV crossover, the network would hype it up as much as they possibly could, and I don't know if it's because I was younger, but I think that those really worked well to hype me up. Nowadays, it feels like you'd be lucky to get even a 10 second spot to advertise a crossover, and that might even be too much. You could post a teaser image or a gif or a small trailer on Twitter or something, and that normally does a good job spreading the word, but I don't know, it just seems so empty and corporate. Boy, give me my baseball bat. I know that the old way of advertising for these small time TV crossover events doesn't really make much sense in the modern world, but that's just how I feel. And that's a pretty bad segue to the main topic of this video. Back in 2011, I vividly remember Fox hyping this big crossover event that they were having with three of their animated TV shows that was set to air in May, and I was on board the whole time. The three shows being Seth MacFarlane's Family Guy, American Dad, and The Cleveland Show. Granted, nowadays I realize how ridiculous hyping up a crossover of these three shows were. I mean, Peter Griffin and Cleveland Brown crossing over, What's next? The second Ted movie? Yeah, okay, that'll be the day. And while in actuality these three shows do cross over, the way in which they do is... rather unconventional. The main characters do appear together on screen for like 30 seconds at the end of the event, but for the rest of the time, each show is delegated to their own separate time slots, with their own characters and canon intact. Instead of a full-on crossover between these three shows, Seth decided to utilize a central storyline, which would affect each of the characters in their own separate show. The storyline being a hurricane ravaging through the hometowns of each of the main characters, hence the event was officially dubbed Night of the Hurricane. Not to be confused with NBC's Hurricane Saturday, an event in which a hurricane swept through the sets of the Golden Girls, Empty Nest, and Nurses. If I had a nickel for every time there was a crossover event where a hurricane makes its way through three shows created by the same person, I'd have two nickels. Which isn't a lot, but it's weird that it happened twice. When it comes to crossovers, this may seem like a cop-out, but I'm actually a bit mixed on this. For one, it does seem a bit misleading to hype up a big crossover event between these three shows, even saying that the dads will appear together, only for the crossover to just be literally three separate episodes, like if you didn't know that this event was a thing, you could honestly just view these on their own, then I could definitely understand being disappointed. That being said, it's not like we haven't seen this sort of thing before. I already mentioned NBC's Hurricane Saturday, but there's also Cartoon Network's Invaded event, which chronicles the story of some alien's mission on Earth through five different TV shows. Even Disney sort of had something like this with their Wish Gonna Miss event, which saw Cory in the House, Sweet Life, and Hannah Montana all making wishes on a shooting star with their wishes coming true. Also, Seth does provide a reason as to why they went down this route. In a conference call with reporters, he said, There were talks initially of doing a crossover with all the characters from all the shows, but it became a little bit of a conundrum because you have three different staff, each of whom is used to writing three different sets of characters. This idea of an outside force that sweeps its way through all three shows seemed like a cool way to accomplish that. And honestly, I'm inclined to agree with him on this. People love to rag on Cleveland Show and American Dad for being more of the same family guy, but if you actually sit down and watch these shows, you'd know that each team does bring their own unique writing styles and jokes to the table that actually make each series stand out. Family Guy isn't the same show as American Dad, American Dad isn't the same show as The Cleveland Show, The Cleveland Show isn't the same show as Family Guy. Kinda, sometimes, with, with that last one. I can respect Seth's restraint in allowing each show to flourish in what they're suited for instead of just some hodgepodge of writing styles and joke structures that may work for one show, but harshly undercuts and misrepresents the other shows. Kind of, um, kind of wish he kept that mindset for a bit longer, though. 
And so, after all the hype and setup, the countless interviews and exclusives, and the months and months of production necessary to see these episodes come to fruition, the Night of the Hurricane event finally aired on May 1st, 2011. The Night of the Hurricane event finally aired on October 2nd, 2011, after an unrelated episode of The Simpsons about Chalmers trying to educate Bart and his bully friends that, you know what, given how stale The Simpsons was around that time, this is actually one of the better episodes they've had. I, I definitely recommend it. So with all that said, do I actually think that this is the worst crossover ever, as the title and thumbnail might have you believe? Well, that's a little complicated to say. Seeing as how the event is more or less just three separate episodes with one central storyline, I think the best way to judge the quality of the crossover is how well each episode utilizes said storyline and rolls with it. I mean, we can also discuss the actual crossover at the end too, but it's like 30 seconds, so I mean, whatever. We'll be covering the episodes in the order they aired that night, meaning that we'll end with American Dad, Family Guy will be smack dab in the middle, and that means we're starting with... You know what, actually, I don't need to talk about this. It's a beautiful day outside, so I think it's time for me to finally get a life. Okay, fine, whatever. I want to get a life anyway. This hurricane named Flozell. Oh, finally, a black hurricane. Rewatching this episode for this video made me remember how much I really don't gel with the writing style of the Cleveland show, because this episode is, um, it's not very good. At the very least, I can give it props for sticking with the central storyline of the hurricane, at least in the first half. So the episode starts out with Cleveland getting ready for a family cruise, only for a hurricane to suddenly hit stool bend. In an act of defiance, Cleveland decides that instead of evacuating, they're going to stay at the house and have a staycation. The only problem is that in preparation of getting ready for the cruise, Cleveland threw all the food away, which means that there's no food in the house at all. So now they have to stave off starvation. All in all though, while I don't really vibe with the feeling or the style that the show puts out, like I said, they stick with the hurricane idea with them being stuck in the house due to the storm. That is, until we get to the second half, when all of a sudden, the episode shifts to this. I don't believe in God. You should not say such things, boy visiting from down the street. Okay, he's mine. You know that. Now, I'm not going to pretend that they straight up forget about the hurricane. It still plays a role in the episode, with it being the through line for the reason to pray and have faith. But you might as well just switch it out with literally anything else that could be seen as an adversity to overcome, and the episode would play out exactly the same. In fact, I'd take it a step further and say that ignoring the lack of food in the tree branch that falls into the house, this plotline of Junior not believing in God could be executed on even the most beautiful of days, and almost nothing would change. I'm not against this storyline, but I have to wonder why, of all the times to reveal this, it would be during the crossover event. It just seems like an extreme waste of a central storyline as interesting as a hurricane. I have to wonder if the writing team originally planned on having an episode revolving around this, but they had to change their plans when they were told about this event, and had to sort of jam this in last minute in order to make it clear to the audience that <gasps> Cleveland Jr. doesn't believe in God?! The fact that this isn't its own episode is even more jarring when you realize that this isn't just something that they forgot about, because I'm pretty sure they have an episode later on where Junior has to like pretend to be a Christian to impress a girl, but I could also just be misremembering. And for me to check would mean watching another episode of The Cleveland Show. And um, I'm sorry, I don't have the right mindset for that right now. Miss Donna, where do you believe in God? I'm a black woman in the South. That's it. Actually, um, I lied earlier. I do have a problem with this storyline because I legitimately don't know what the message is that they're trying to tell us here. 
So when Junior reveals that he doesn't believe in God, the rest of the family confronts him and tries to get him to convert to Christianity, even having a whole big production number that's actually very catchy. After that doesn't work, they all get very angry when they believe that Junior is hoarding food, when in actuality he prepared for the storm days in advance and rationed the food, but they don't believe him, and when Cleveland, in a fit of blind rage, casts God's anger on Junior, it is instead the father that is pinned down by the giant tree branch. The rest of the family refuse to let Junior try to help get the branch off his father, so after he sees their praying not working, he develops a pulley system to lift the branch off his father, allowing him to escape. Okay, so, like, pretty good moral about letting people believe in what they want as long as they come through in the end and, you know, like, they're not hurting anybody. Except, no, because the emotional lesson of this story happens in the scene just before when Donna explains to Junior that people have faith and pray because it allows them to overcome adversity, even comparing it to the Force. And he actually buys it. Uh... So apparently the episode is trying to say that it wasn't the family that was in the wrong, it was Cleveland Jr. for not believing that prayer could work. I'm sorry, did we watch the same episode? because I'm pretty sure I remember that it was the family who pressured Junior to try and impose their beliefs on him, with him just trying to believe what he wants without throwing Christianity under the bus, and him totally okay with the rest of the family praying. In fact, the only time he even lashes out, if you can even call it that, is when he's wrongfully accused of hoarding the food, to which he locks it up and tells them they can pray for food. Which, you know, admittedly, that's a dick thing to do when there's no food, but like, they were so mean to him this whole time. Uh, this is the first time he snapped at them in this episode. Of course he's still in the right here, right? And yet he's still the outcast despite saving the day in the end? What exactly am I supposed to make of this? I'm not going to go into deep discussion of the whole religious debate because honestly, I'm not the best person to discuss that, but I will absolutely call bullshit on this episode for trying to flip the script. I really don't want to add to the stigma of this being a cheap knockoff, but come on, even Family Guy pulled this exact message off and a lot better. Speaking of, before you finish off, I just wanted to mention that this episode really loved referencing Family Guy. Like, I know this is a crossover episode, but it really felt like they were constantly trying to bring the show up in some way, shape, or form. Atheism is a religion too, and those people are the worst! You remember Brian Griffin back in Quahog? I will say though, I think that Loretta telling Junior that Jesus forgave her after her affair with Quagmire being Junior's catalyst for not believing in God is actually a pretty nice touch. Anyways, uh, that's all I'm going to say about the Cleveland show forever probably, so I hope you all got your fill. After that mess, I'm very much looking forward to what Family Guy has to offer. I mean, it can't be any worse than that. WRONG! You know, I'm thinking of taking up bankruptcy as a hobby. This episode... Uh, this, this one is, um... It's quite an infamous one, isn't it? Many cite this as the turning point for the show, when everything really started going downhill for the show, and one of, if not the worst episodes of the show. And you know, I could talk about this episode in great detail, but instead... I think I'd rather pressure, I mean, ask, ask a friend to talk about this episode. And uh, I think there's only one person fit for this job. Hey man, how's it going? We're doing, we're doing a lot of cool stuff. So um, anyway, I called because um, I'm doing a video about... Uh, a Family Guy episode, and I wanted to know if you wanted to watch and talk about the Seahorse Seashell Party episode. The episode is definitely really bad, don't get me wrong, but I don't think it's as bad as a lot of people make it out to be. Kinda? 
Okay, let me let me just let me just explain the bad stuff first. The entire episode takes place with the family stuck in the house having to wait out the hurricane as it passes over their town. We then see how the family passes the time with hilarious and not at all annoying gags such as finger banging, singing along to a song with no words, making mouth noises, absolutely riveting. Okay, so the episode isn't funny, that right, there is a big bane against the show's favor. Instead, they try and focus all their energy telling a serious emotional story about Meg being fed up with being the family punching bag, and her literally going off on Peter, Lois, and Chris for how awful they've been treating her. And yeah, she definitely has a point. She's never been the most fleshed out character, but especially when the show came back from cancellation, they've been non-stop assaulting Meg physically and verbally whenever they can. Most of it's played for jokes for the viewers, and I'd be lying if I said that it didn't get a good chuckle out of me every once in a while, but I could totally understand how the actual character of Meg is just like completely done with this BS and finally fighting back. It definitely feels warranted at this point. The family even seems to understand the pain they've caused Meg and they want to change their ways. This episode still isn't funny, no matter how hard it tries to be. You know, Brian, you may be a dog, but you're a pretty cool cat. So we just said that. Take it home with you. But this could go down as a massive turning point for the show where Meg actually starts to become a character and not just a punching bag, right? Oh, wow, everybody's already tweeting Stewie just said that. Problem number one. While this part of the episode feels very cathartic and absolutely deserved for a character who's been treated like this, we still have to suffer through the first third of this episode, which is nothing but long and drawn out jokes jokes in air quotes because they aren't funny in case you um, in case you couldn't tell. Problem number two. With them not using Meg as a punching bag anymore, they now divert their anger to one another, making them all miserable. And so, at the end of the episode, Meg decides that, actually, I'm going to keep being the punching bag so that the family can be healthy and happy once again. This is my obligation. And the episode ends on a happy note, with Meg resuming her normal bottom of the rung position for the rest of time. So the next episode of Family Guy is about Quagmire's physically abused sis- Look, I know the kind of show Family Guy was around this time. It didn't really have to deliver a message or morale or whatever, and is more focused on delivering the hyucks at everyone's expense. And saying that this is the lesson of the episode would be saying that the writers were very tone deaf as to what exactly they're trying to say, and so I'm gonna give them the benefit of the doubt and say that this is less so immoral, and more so like a return to the status quo, which is definitely better. But it's also really bad, and now that I think about it, it might actually be worse in some ways. If we're just returning to the same old, same old, um, what was the point of literally any of this? I condemn the Cleveland show for squeezing in Junior's religious beliefs into this episode, but at the very least, they stuck with that change throughout the rest of the show. Here, though, we just wasted 22 minutes feeling like we were tricked into a character making a big decision only for the showrunners to say, Boy, Boy were they wrong. wrong! You probably noticed I haven't mentioned the hurricane all that much here, and that's because I honestly forgot it played a part in this episode at all when I started ranting about the Meg stuff. Once the news exposition in the beginning explaining this is done, you could just basically forget the hurricane is even a threat because literally nothing happens with it. The Cleveland Show's episode at least had the hurricane affect some aspects of it. Meanwhile, the only thing it's doing here is keeping the Griffins trapped in their house, which besides the fact that that could literally happen in any other episode for any other reason, that means we've got a bottle episode on our hands. For those unaware, bottle episodes are basically produced to bring the number of episodes up, but as cheaply as possible, limiting the number of characters, backgrounds, sets, and in the case of animation, assets, normally taking place in one or two very similar set pieces. This isn't a riff on bottle episodes, by the way. There are plenty of examples of bottle episodes being a great way to examine characters and their relationships and headspaces. Some standout examples include Bojack Horseman's Free Churro, Archer's Vision Quest, and even Family Guy themselves had an excellent bottle episode with Brian and Stewie. Which makes this bottle episode even more pathetic given how unfunny and ultimately undercut it feels. Except it may not even be a bottle episode because the B plot involves Brian tripping out on mushrooms and having insane visions, and these are insanely impressive, but I know that they cost a lot of time and effort. 
they had to make new assets for each of these monstrosities and backgrounds. That's literally the opposite of the point of a bottle episode. It's, it's very confusing. Also, it doesn't really tie in with the show's A plot, and there wasn't actually even a story with the B plot. It's, it's literally just Brian taking mushrooms and tripping and then coming down. So it honestly was just an excuse for some really sickly looking designs and animation. This episode, man, it, it's an enigma. Brian? I'm gonna cut my ear off to prevent World War II. Ah! Ah! Oh god! Oh god! So with all that said, it seems like I must really hate this episode, right? Like it really is as bad as people have made it out to seem. Possibly even worse? Yeah, absolutely. Or, you know, at least that's what I would have said years ago. See, when this episode came out, the Meg hate was at its absolute worst. Constantly punching her down physically and verbally just to get a laugh in when honestly she didn't deserve any of it. And it just stopped being funny after a while. Hi, Dad. When this episode came out, it basically just solidly confirmed that they do not care about Meg, and they continued to treat her the same way for a long while after this episode came out. But then something happened. The later we go into the series, the more Meg sort of grew as a character in a way? Like, they still don't know how to write a teenage girl, but at the very least, they were giving her things to do. And most importantly, they switched the most important thing about her. She'll bite back or roll with the punches. She'll embrace her outcast status instead of trying to fit in with everyone else. Instead of burying her into the ground, she sort of forged her own path in a way. They still do find the time to poke fun at her, but it's, it's nowhere near as mean-spirited as it was in the early 2010s. I really love this new direction they took the character in, and as such, it got me rethinking how exactly I feel about this episode. It's still a very bad episode, don't get me wrong, it is absolutely the worst of this series of episodes that we're looking at today. But instead of it being the worst of the worst and the turning point of Family Guy's downward spiral, I think of it more as a big bump in the road that we had to overcome to get to where we are today. It's not perfect, but it's much better than where we were when this episode first aired. And because of that, I really don't think it's the worst the show has to offer. Lest we forget, the actual worst episode was the very next episode they aired. Season 10 was a very dark place for the show. Wow, uh, surprise of the century, I think the American Dad episode is the best of the trio. Not that there's much competition, and it isn't one of the best episodes of the show, but it does do two things that make it significantly better than the other two shows' offerings. It utilizes the hurricane in an interesting and enjoyable way, and it's funny. I'll never forget you, Roger. Just ignore her. Ah! No! Sweatshirt! When the hurricane hits Virginia, Stan and Francine argue as to the best way to handle the situation, with Francine thinking they should evacuate, and Stan thinking they'd be safer staying at home, with Francine mentioning that Stan constantly has ideas that sound good, but always lead to more problems in a crisis situation. The episode basically plays into this more and more, with things constantly getting worse and worse thanks to Stan, flipping the house upside down, and even letting a shark into the house. What a beautiful creature. And we know so little about them. Despite this, I don't really feel angry or upset with Stan because the choices he makes actually make sense. It's just that he has bad luck with how they work out. Not to mention that you can clearly see that he's trying to help and that everything that he's doing, he's doing out of love and for the protection of him and his family. You even think he's going to redeem himself at the end and his choices are going to save the day. But actually, things get even worse than before, eventually culminating with... <laughs> While this is mostly a Stan and Francine story, everyone else here is at their A-game too. Roger with his annoying fling, Steve with his architecture jargon, even Haley and Jeff play a big role, being the only ones to support Stan's choices in the beginning. It's great to see the whole family working together to overcome something after the past two episodes boiled down to basically the families ganging up on one particular member and that basically being the whole thing. I know this feels like I'm scraping the bottom of the barrel here, but it, it just feels good to watch a good episode again. I, I, I missed this so much. 
Speaking of scraping the bottom of the barrel, remember the hurricane, aka the central theme of each of these episodes? Well, it finally plays a major role, and it only took 44 minutes to get here. Admittedly, it does kind of just boil down once again to the family being stuck in that house again, but the hurricane is actually causing problems for the family besides that. Once the seawall breaks, the house is pushed along with the current, the house flipping upside down causes the attic to flood with water, and Haley opening the window leads to the shark getting in the house, which adds a really good amount of tension to this episode. Wow, it's almost like they knew how to incorporate the hurricane in an entertaining way, and it wasn't just an afterthought. Who would have guessed? Side note, but I think it's funny they got Kristen Schaal to guest star in the same year that Bob's Burgers premiered and a year before Gravity Falls only to kill her off in a very gruesome manner. We're gonna have lots of babies. No, 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 no. I don't have much more to say about this episode. It's absolutely like no contest, the best of the bunch by a landslide. And I look forward to covering it again when I talk about every American Dad episode in my big ranking video this year. But we're not quite done yet, as this episode ends with the moment we've all been waiting for, the big crossover. Looter! Self-defense! A black and a white talking as if it's normal! I know. I'm as shocked as you guys are. Cleveland Brown and Peter Griffin in the same show? What voodoo witchcraft was pulled off to make this happen? Anyways, yeah, funny scene. Stan, have you- <laughs> Oh man, classic American dad. might not make sense, but that's what faith is. Standing in the face of adversity and believing that everything's gonna be okay. Your only arguable accomplishments are your kids. And look at us. We're a disaster. Hey, watch it. I just wanted to prove I'm good in a crisis. I failed. Stan. 99% of the time, there is no crisis, and you're a wonderful husband and father. So let's circle back to the question I pondered at the beginning of this video. Is this actually the worst crossover ever? Well, it's definitely not the best. Ignoring my bias towards The Cleveland Show, that still doesn't excuse how two of the three episodes barely utilize the Hurricane storyline, with Family Guy basically forgetting about it after the first 30 seconds. It also doesn't help that said episodes tried to utilize stronger character moments and emotional scenes over jokes to a detrimental effect, especially with Family Guy. But for what it's worth, the parts that I did enjoy did a good job balancing out the not-so-good stuff. And I do think it was very smart to keep these episodes limited to crossing over via a central storyline instead of having the characters actually cross over for a full 90 minute event or even a 22 minute episode. While the 30 seconds we got at the end were very entertaining, I can only imagine how much the three different writing styles would clash into a smorgasbord of nonsense and constantly talking down on one another. And to be perfectly frank, I'd take a bad episode, a mid episode, and a pretty good episode any day over a messy and confused crossover special. But I don't know, maybe that's just me. Either way, I'm glad this exists, and you know, maybe with a little bit of ironing out of some of the kinks that we saw here, I really do hope that we can get something like this again in the future, and not like... Yeah... 